Hello and welcome to What's The Story. We're an inquisitive bunch of hosts from the What's The Story team on a mission to uncover stories about faith and courage from everyday people. And to help us do just that, we get the privilege to chat with amazing guests and delve into their faith journey, the hurdles they've overcome, and the life lessons they have learned along the way. Now, if you enjoy our podcast, don't forget to subscribe and sign up for our newsletter on our website, which is whatsthestorypodcast.com. It's your direct line to the latest episodes and detailed show notes, and they all get delivered straight to your inbox. And the best part, it's absolutely free. What's the Story is brought to you by Crowd Church. We understand that stepping into a traditional church might not be everybody's cup of tea. And that's where Crowd Church steps in, providing a digital sanctuary, a safe space to explore the Christian faith where you can engage in meaningful conversations rather than just simply spectating. So whether you are new to the Christian faith or are in search of a new church family, we invite you to visit us at www.crowd.church. And if you've got any questions, just drop us an email at hello at crowd.church. We're here to help and would genuinely love to connect with you. And now, without further ado, let's meet your host, and our very special guest for today. Hi, I'm Sada Fainan, and I'm here on What's the Story podcast with Deborah McNinch. She is a believer, she's a mom, and she's the founder of Battle Cry Mom. Now, Deborah, thank you so much for being here with us today. Why don't you share with us really briefly an overview of your journey and what led you to where you are today? Yes, thank you so much for having me on. And I just love this opportunity to tell my story. So mm -hmm. I have, you know, this, the beginning of my story is probably very typical as so many people. Mm -hmm. I was saved um, in high school. Um, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was December 23rd, 1983. I was baptized January 9th, 1984. I could tell you what I was wearing. I could tell you what I prayed. I mean, it was a very real experience. And so that was my journey of following the Lord and just figuring out who he was. And I, I led that path for a couple of years. And like mm -hmm. many people, I went to college and kind of just put that all on a back burner. And kind of that was secondary to my life for many, many years. And mm. I got married and met the love of my life that I've been married to for 32 years now. Um, wow. And, you know, during that time, you know, we got married, we had kids. And it wasn't until I had my first son that I woke up and was like, hmm, we need to be in church. Mm -hmm. And so I always just knew that I wanted to bring my kids up in the faith. And I knew it was time for me to really just get serious about who I was and who Jesus was. And so um, we had three children. We went to church. We did all of those things. And it wasn't until my husband actually got caught in a downsizing and a layoff at his job mm. that I finally like really clung to my faith. I would be telling people out in public, oh yeah, the Lord has us, you know, we're going to be okay. But at home I was crying going, Lord, what are you doing? Mm. Like, are you sure you're going to take care of me? Mm. And it was during that time that I really found out who the Lord was. Mm. And he does, he just became more than just my savior. He became my Lord. And that was a turning point for me in my faith. And it was no looking back after that. And so I feel like we raised our kids. We did we did all the things. We have been on this journey of moving. My husband's job has moved us nine times. And so we're professional movers. <laughs> um, I always say we like to tell people we play hide and seek, but on a national level. And so my husband goes and hides and then the family mm. finds him. That was kind of like what mm. we would always tell people. And so we have had an incredible mm. journey of mm. seeing new places um, discovering new cities and new and new friends and new mm -hmm. churches. And it has just been an amazing mm. walk with the Lord. Our kids were amazing. Um, we had the, I, I always say we were rock star parents. You know, we, we came through the teenage years with no problems yeah. and I just loved my little family. So that kind of gets us up to the modern day mm. um, where my life kind of changed. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Deborah, for sharing that. And I want to unpack that a bit more. So tell me how your faith influenced the foundations of your family life and parenting style, because you said like, you know, after you had your first son, you were like, okay, we need to get back to church. So how did your faith influence that? Right. So I really feel like, you know, we did, we did all the Christian things that Mm. you're supposed to do. You know, we were active in church. Mm. We, our kids went to youth group. We hosted youth group. You know, we prayed, um, we believed, you know, we sent them to Christian school. Mm. And so, and then they went to Christian college, you know, so I feel like we did all of these things to really give them a foundation of who we are and who our family was and what we believed. And, you know, I think I always thought their, their faith was very strong and, Mm. and what they believed. And I just kind of assumed that since this was our family's belief and this was my belief, it would just automatically roll over to Mm -hmm. the children. Like they didn't Mm -hmm. have a choice I chose for them. And so Mm. um, what I found out later that that's kind of not the case. (laughs) Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into that. I just wanted to go back to what you said about your, you know, playing hide and seek (laughs) across the country. Yeah. Um, How did how did your how did your faith keep you guys connected and, you know, strong Mm -hmm. as a family unit, even with all that moving around? Because that's got to take its toll eventually. It does. Um, I think there are, I always say there's probably a million advantages that mm. we gave our children mm. with moving. And there was probably a million disadvantages at the same time with moving and always starting over and always being mm. the new kid. But, you know, it was always such a good time. I always had these little things I would do with my kids before we would move. I would send off to like the chamber of commerce of mm. our new city and get a, like a bro- like a whole packet of stuff to do in the area. Yeah. Mm. And we would just like unpack all that. And sometimes I would get a map and we would study the map mm. so we could find shortcuts to get around town. And we would, it was mm. just always an adventure. We just mm. always considered it. I always liked that Stephen Curtis Chapman song, you know, the, the great adventure. And we would always play that on the day I was pulling out of the driveway with my kids to move to a new town. I was like, we're putting on the great adventure today because we just always looked at it as Mm. the Lord had sent us. We never went Mm. anywhere that the Lord didn't tell us to go. Mm. And so I felt like that was like the central part of our faith was, you know, sometimes you listen to the Lord and you have to do things. Mm. Maybe you don't want to do Mm -hmm. like, you know, we had to leave a lot of good friends, Mm. uh, a lot of good churches over the years, a lot of good things to follow the Lord's leading. And so Mm. um, it's always worked out. It's always been amazing. And I'm so thankful. That's, that's really quite incredible, actually, being able to follow the Lord's leading, you know, in full obedience. And yeah, you're right. When you do that, there, it is such an enriching experience. Yeah. Um, so when we had our pre-call where we, we kind of talked and got to know each other before we are doing this, re- this recording now, um, one of the things you talked about was a very pivotal moment in life. So I was wondering if you could take us back to that time when you received that phone call and just, you know, tell our listeners a bit about, about um, your journey from that point. Yes, I would love to. So like I said, we raised three kids and they were all adults out of our house in college, out of college on their own. And, you know, we, I was just sitting back, you know, I was, it was like, I was, I had built this beach house on Mm -hmm. the beach and then on Malibu beach house. And I was just looking at the ocean all the time, just waiting for Mm -hmm. like the grandkids to roll in, just waiting for like the next steps because Mm -hmm. we had done our jobs and had raised these amazing kids. And I never knew there's this famous picture that you can look up and find on the internet. It's of the tsunami in, Mm. um, in Thailand when it hit and it's all these people on the beach. And there's this picture of this huge wave that's offshore Mm. that's coming in and nobody on that beach knew that they were getting ready to be hit with this wave. And Mm. I always kind of feel like that's, that's like a picture of my life. Mm -hmm. I was sitting on this beach in my beach house, waiting for the next steps to happen. And what I didn't know was there was a wave getting ready to come in and hit me. Mm -hmm. And that wave came in the form of a phone call from my oldest child that that needed to, that called me one day and said, mom, I'm transgender. Mm -hmm. And those words at that time, one, I, I honestly didn't know what it meant. (laughs) 
<laughs> at mm. that time. That was mm -hmm. really still very early in the journey with this, uh, with the movement that we see today. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I, and honestly, I didn't know what it was going to mean for, for not just him and his journey, mm -hmm. but ultimately what it was going to be for my family and my journey and my faith journey. And so mm -hmm. that phone call was that wave that knocked down that house that I had built. Mm -hmm. And what was left was me standing on this firm foundation. And I would go back to that old kid song, you know, the wise man builds his house mm -hmm. upon the rock. So I had to decide if my house was built up on the rock or was it on the sand and it was going to sink. And that mm -hmm. was like a pivotal moment in my faith. Mm -hmm. Can you take us back to that call that you got and um, share with us your immediate thoughts and feelings when you heard your, yes. your son out? Yes. I, you know, I feel like I could have written a book of, mm. you know, a thousand things that went through my head in 10 seconds mm. because there were so many things. But the very, very first thing that I remember when mm. I hung up that phone call that day mm. was I heard the Lord very clearly say to me, it is your job to love him. Mm. It is my job to save him. And I knew right there that somehow it was going to be okay someday, but it was, it was my job as a mom to love him where mm. he was at mm. and to love him through it. And it was going to be the kindness, like the word says, the kindness of the Lord that brings us to repentance. It was going to have to be the Lord's kindness that would draw him to salvation one day. Mm. And so, mm. you know, my first thoughts were what in the world um, I had had, someone many years before that I'd even had a dream before that one day I would write a book and one day I would speak about this book mm. and I never really put too much stock in that it was just something in my head for 20 years mm -hmm. and I thought, oh maybe someday I will write this book about how to be a perfect parent because mm. you know maybe that's all I knew you know was yeah. how to be a good parent yeah. and then this happened and I was like are you kidding is <laughs> this going to be about mm. like there's no way Mm. Or there's no way I could talk about this. Mm. It took me years past this phone call to be able to form the words mm. of to say what I was feeling. And mm. so um, the journey I was now on was not one that I chose, mm. but it was what the Lord had put us on. And I had to decide, am I going to be faithful and still love the Lord? Or what is this going to look like for me? Mm. I love that what the Lord gave you was that to love your son was your job and to save him is, is God's job. And it's, that's so true, isn't it? Like we, we don't, we don't do the saving. That's, that's God's department. We do the praying. Yeah. So what was that? What was it like? I mean, I'd imagine there'd be, um, there would be a sense of embarrassment and, mm -hmm. you know, like you've, you've had this, this family that you have nurtured for so long and um and then like you know you're going back out into your community with this understanding of where your son's at and i would i mean maybe i'm putting words in your mouth but was there a sense of embarrassment was there a sense of shame how did you get to the point where you were able to hold your head high yeah so mm -hmm. all of those things mm -hmm. i went through you know years of all of those emotions i went through shame and i went mm -hmm. through embarrassment and but i always want to come back to the embarrassment was not on him mm -hmm. i wasn't embarrassed about him mm -hmm. that he was my son and making this choice the embarrassment came on me yeah. that i felt like i was supposed to be a perfect parent and i yes. wasn't and people were going to be talking about that and so that yeah. was my pride also yeah. Yeah. that i realized and so during all of this the lord just had to mm. tear down every single thing that was in me mm. to get me to where i could be a vessel that he could use to tell this story mm. and so definitely there was shame mm. and it took years to really learn how to lay that down mm. and hold my head high and say that our family looks like this yeah. and when this first happened i promised myself three things if mm. I could ever find a way out of this pain I would I would tell people mm. I would talk about our story even if I mm. cried the whole time even if I you know rambled on like a crazy lady like I would tell the story mm. to I know there was other moms I didn't know any at the time, mm. but I knew there had to be other moms like me out there yeah. that needed support. And I, mm. you know, I just promised that I would build a support group mm. for moms mm. that they, people like me that had kids that didn't, 
take on the faith of their families mm. that we thought we would. What can we do? How do we survive? What, how do we get through this? Mm. And then I also promised that I would never stop believing that God was a God of miracles and mm. that he alone can part the sea. And so I could just trust that he had a plan for my family and it was good. And I, and so those were the things at the beginning that I had to just get through and believe and work through every, every little step of the way. Mm -hmm. I know we kind of talked about, um, besides shame and, and embarrassment and hurt, um, there was a lot of jealousy that, mm -hmm. that really rose mm -hmm. up in my spirit as well that I didn't even know was there. And I, mm -hmm. I had really become jealous of other families. I would go to church and I'd see little perfect families sitting with their perfectly dressed children. Mm -hmm. And I would remember that that one day that was me not too many years before, hmm. but then I was just so jealous that it wasn't my family now. And, hmm. and that was, that was never going to happen. I wasn't going to have that moment where all my kids would come home and we'd go to church together on Easter or hmm. whatever. And so it was a loss of dreams. It mm. was just, it was a jealousy of what everybody else had that I didn't. Mm. Um, everybody, it seemed that I knew, you know, with our age group and, and our friends, they were starting to have grandchildren. And I, I didn't even know I wanted grandchildren. I mean, I didn't even, I had never even thought about that. And mm. then all of a sudden, everybody was having a grandbaby except me. Mm. And it just got to the point that, Lord, are you kidding? You know, this is, I want this too. Mm. So, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I, I, I didn't mean embarrassment like for him. Yeah. Um, I completely agree. Yeah. You're right. Maybe pride is a better, yes. better word for that. You've shared a bit about how this, this pivotal moment challenged you personally, you know, the aftermath of that call. Mm -hmm. What was it like within the family? So you, you've got, I know you've got two other kids, your husband. Right. What, what was that like? Right. So, you know, I, we had been a very close tight knit mm. family prior to this and, you know, with that announcement, it split, it split the waters. And then mm. it felt like everybody was kind of taking a side of where to land on that. Mm. And, and so what used to be, you know, a tight knit family was now one that didn't speak anymore. Um, kids that don't communicate. Um, you know, mm. so that what that means, not just like for their relationship, but also meant that mm. Christmas was never going to happen at my house again. Mm. I was never going to have those holiday dinners that everybody else had. And so, you know, this announcement changed everything. It wasn't just this one kind of thing for my child. It affected every part of my life and the dreams that I had yeah. that I thought was going to happen. Mm. Mm. How did you lean on your faith then during this time? Like, how did you hold every, how did you keep your family together? How did you keep yourself together? Um, were there moments of doubt? Were there, um, or like revelation even that maybe reshaped you as a person? Yes. Right. So I think it was a daily walk and, mm. you know, I kind of know now that's what the Lord asks mm. us to do. Mm -hmm. He doesn't ask us to plan for 20 years, but he asks us to walk with him today. Yeah. And I had, you know, I, I think my brain went to, um, a lot of, almost research, if you will, hmm. in a way. And so I had found that the church, you know, I'm going to talk about the capital C church, yep. the church as a whole yeah. had two doors mm -hmm. and I could walk door a over here was, you know, your child has made a huge mistake. You must turn him out and not talk to him anymore. This yeah. is not God's will. Hmm. You've got to let him go. And then there was this door over here that said, oh no, we affirm this decision. This is perfect. He can be anything he wants to be. Mm. God still loves him. And I had to wrestle with those two kind of doors for a long mm. time. Mm. And, you know, it, it was like I had to make a choice of where I was going to land on this issue. And this is why so many parents maybe once had a strong faith and you've seen them walk away when a decision like this hits them because there's mm. no real option as to what to do and there's no real guidance. And so I found myself not going through door A and I wasn't going to go through door B that I was going to create a door C and that mm -hmm. door is going to be one where I could love and support my child as a person, but at the same time, hold dear to my faith and my mm -hmm. beliefs. 
not compromise on what I know the word of God says and how that went together for me was, um, luckily a lot of parents, you know, their, their children won't talk to them or, Mm. you know, they become estranged during these seasons. But I have, I've been very fortunate that I've maintained a relationship with my kid that I love very dearly Mm. during all of this. But, you know, it was just this big wrestle every day of where do I fit in the church Mm. now? Do I even, can I still go to church? Does God still love me? That was a question that, Mm. you know, I would wrestle with a lot. And if I love my child, does that mean I'm going to hell? Mm. You know, these were the things that would keep me awake at night. Like, Mm. where do I fit into the big scheme of things, into God's plan? Do I even have a purpose anymore? Do I have, could he use me for anything anymore because of this? Because I failed as a parent. I felt like I had failed to raise Christian children. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, like what, I mean, he's not going to trust me with anything else, but Mm -hmm. you know, as I impacted this over the years and, and just really wrestled with what he was saying, I just really came to this like realization that I cannot, you know, hate my child to heaven. Mm -hmm. I can't hate him so much that he'll go to heaven. But on the other hand, I cannot love him straight to hell. Mm -hmm. I have to love him in the truth. And so for me, that was my journey was just figuring out who I was Mm -hmm. in the Lord and who I could be. And it was actually during a, we had moved to a new place and I had started going to this Bible study and Mm -hmm. I had not told anybody my story in our new town. And one night the Bible study, the the kind of talk went Mm -hmm. around that movement, the LGBT movement and I, I, I had planned on not saying anything as I normally do. I kind of just stay out of the conversation, mm. but that, there was something about that particular day that something that was said there that just struck me right in my soul. Mm. And I knew it was time to speak up that I wasn't going to hold my head with embarrassment. Mm. I wasn't going to hold my head in shame, but I was going to speak up and say, this is what I am walking through. Mm. This is what God is doing. And, you know, this is who God is. And I had to make a choice that day to not that, you know, it says in Revelation that we will overcome by mm. the blood of the life and the word of our testimony. And I had to decide that night that I was going to speak up and I was going to do it brave mm. and I was going to do it in the, power of the Lord and his spirit guiding me. Mm. And so it was a daily journey. There's still days I get out of bed and think, I don't think mm. I can do this. I, I wish this wasn't my life. Mm. Um, there's days I get out of bed and I'm like, I had this heap of ashes on the ground that was broken and dismembered and, and God put those back together into something beautiful. And I'm so mm. thankful. For that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I might be going off on a tangent here. Maybe it's an, a conversation for another podcast, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I guess like one of the things as you're talking, it's like, makes me wonder what, what could church do differently you know, to, to make it easier for like where you were at, you had to find a door C that right. wasn't right. obvious. You had to look for it and find it. So how, you know, how can church support yes, people that would be in your like position? A great conversation mm. to have. Mm. You know? And I think it, there's, that's such a wide open door to talk mm. about. You know, we have, you know, there's some political things mixed in this message. And so mm. a lot of churches, they don't want any part of anything to do with any of that. Yeah. Um, you know, but our churches as a whole, I believe they've become these country clubs Mm. where people have to come put together. Mm. People have to come put together in their perfect outfits and their perfect makeup and their perfect hair, singing the perfect songs every Sunday. Mm. And it it got away from the hospital for broken people that it used Mm. to be. Mm. Um, and and that's been my experience, I should say in churches. And so I think we have to get back to just having a time. I have never been in a church Mm. where I have heard the pastor preach on the prodigal son Mm. and ask who has a prodigal child who is brave enough to stand up right here in the sanctuary Mm. before the Lord and say, I do. Yeah. And then have, you know, and come down front. I don't have a problem with preachers preaching God's word in truth and saying that different lifestyles and different things goes against you know, his plan. I, Mm. I, people ask me if I get offended. Absolutely do not. You know, I I get offended by the word of God because it's truth. Mm. But what hurts me 
is the fact that the next message should be, so we're going to get on our faces right now on this altar before the Lord, and we're going to pray these kids home. Hmm. So that should be the next message. I know the Lord kind of gave me a vision one day of the church. And it's like, it was like this big puzzle Mm. and the puzzle, you could see the picture. It was almost all together. There was this one piece missing at the bottom and, you know, the church is ready for the rapture. We are ready Mm. to get out of here. We're just, we want God to come get us and and get us home. We're all ready. We're all itching to go home, Mm. but there's that. And, you know, I feel like the church is saying, yeah, yeah, we can see the picture. It's fine. Let's just go and get out of here. But Mm. that one piece is still missing. Mm. That one piece is our children. And until that piece is back and the prodigals are home, we have work to do. And we, mm. we're not going to be raptured out of here until all of the children yeah. are home. Mm. And so my message to the churches is just to stand with your parents, ask them, mm. you know, who has a prodigal child come along beside them. Mm. You know, when your child dies or you have a tragedy happen, people should show up at your door with casseroles and mm. Hallmark cards. Mm. When you have a prodigal child and you've lost the, the family that you thought you had and the dreams that you thought you had, nobody comes by with cookies. Mm. And so there's just, nobody knows what to say sometimes. And so they don't say anything, yeah. but we yeah. have to do better about getting into people's stories and mm. sharing their pain with them. I like to call mm. them our mat carriers. You know, I love the story, yeah. the paralytic that it took four people to get get that person before Jesus. Says, mm. I need friends. I have to have people to help me mm. to get my child before the Lord. Mm. No, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I think mm-hmm. um, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I want to keep moving. So I know um, I, I want to talk about Battle Cry Mom. Yes. So tell us about that. Tell us what um, like what is at the heart, of, like what's the heart of that mission or message, however you yes. want to put it. Yeah. So when, like I said, when this first happened, Mm -hmm. I was alone. I didn't know what I was going to do, who I was going to tell, but I knew there had to be another mom out there, Mm. a mom like me that had the same values and the same hopes for her family. And so what the Lord gave me was just the ability to start my own kind of social media network. Mm. And it was just a group that, and I honestly, from the beginning, I thought there might be a hundred moms, you know, I kind of had a goal like, Ooh, if we could get a hundred moms, you know, going through kind of what I was going through, that would be amazing. And so we launched a couple of years ago and we're coming up on our third anniversary Mm -hmm. in May, but what it is, it's just, it's kind of like your major social media networks, but it Mm. has nothing to do with them. So inside my group, it it has, um, it would be kind of like a Facebook inside. That's how it operates. Mm. So what it is, it's just a place for moms that have prodigal children or grandmas or Mm. aunts or uncles or next door neighbors. If you know a prodigal and you're praying for them, you're welcome in our group. Mm. So it's just a beautiful spot. When I first kind of got this idea to start it, I thought, well, that is going to be the most depressing group in the history of the world. Like who's going to want to be in there with crying moms all day, but really it's not, it is the most hope filled Mm. joy group I could have ever I didn't even imagine but the Lord knew and so Mm. what we do together is we believe we believe together we pray together and we hope together and we Mm. encourage each other it's modeled sort of after like Moses and Aaron and her when Moses was fighting the armies and he had his arms up and he was too tired and so we put him down and they would start to lose the battle two friends Mm. came and helped and that's what we do for one another. Mm. We hold each other's arms up in this battle. This is a war we are in for our children and for this nation and for our um, our world. Mm. And we have got to get to a, a, a stance of fighting. Mm. But we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory because Jesus already has the victory. That's and right. so but it's just a beautiful, mm. beautiful place that we gather. And in the main group, we also have broken down into mm. little groups. And okay. so if you're a mom with an LGBTQ kid, um, there's a group for you. If mm. you're a mom that has a child in prison, mm. there's a group for you. If, you have a, if you're a mom that has a child addicted to drugs, there's a group for you. If you're a mom that has a child that mm. you don't talk to, there's a group for you. And if you're a mom that just has a kid that simply doesn't believe, there's a group mm. for you. So within our big group, we have all these little groups. And so what that does is it allows me mm. to contact and to just connect with mm-hmm. other moms walking through the exact same thing. I yeah. Am. And then we can bounce ideas off of each mm. other. 
That's very cool. And I love how um, you, you said this earlier about praying your children home. And it's not just, you know, in the LGBTQ area. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's all the prodigals Every. in whatever shape yes. or form, right? Yeah. Yes. But, there's there's lost hmm. and there's found. Yes. There, there's not <laughs> levels. There's yeah. not levels. You know, sometimes mm. I feel like we might be at a level 10, but there are not <laughs> levels. There's just lost yeah. and found. Mm. Mm. Um, so in these groups that you've got and um, this community that you're in now, you rub shoulders with so many different moms. Um, how has creating this community impacted you personally? It has been, like I kind of said before, like I had this like ashes on the ground and I, mm. I never would have dreamed that something beautiful would have come out of it. Mm. And I can't, I mean, it, for me personally, it has been my lifeline. It has been just the most beautiful, like part of my life. I didn't even know I needed. And within mm. our group, we talk about something that the Lord kind of gave me at the beginning called our battle plan. Yeah. And it's just a very simple five-step plan, but we, mm. we just talk about each step and we just, you know, it's just this group that like, I hear a song on the radio and I'll, I'll post it and be like, Hey, the song spoke to me today. Or somebody will be like, I read this, this verse this morning mm. and they'll post it and be like, this is what it means. And this is what I mm. hear the Lord saying about it for our children. And so mm. it's just this encouragement and it's all centered in God's word. And we are a very non-denominational site. Mm. I tell tell people that's one of the very first things we tell them when they join is we do not discuss politics. We don't care who the president is. We don't mm. care if you had a vaccine. We don't care who you voted for. All yeah. we care about mm. is, you know, is if the Lord, you know, what he's doing in your life and that he's going to bring your child home. And so mm. we have anywhere from Pentecostals to Lutherans to Catholics. We have mm. every denomination kind of represented in our group, but we stay focused on the one thing. Mm. It's our one thing. Our mm. one thing is bringing our children back to Jesus. Mm. That's incredible. So through this, um, you know, from having that call to three years ago, creating this community of moms and where you are at now, how has your perception of God's love and grace evolved? You know, I think before I was very, probably just because of my upbringing, mm. just very like, I, I didn't, I didn't realize there were so many facets of his love mm. and how he could love and, and not even that he could love my children in different ways. It was me. Like mm. I didn't know he could love me through some of my ugliness. And so I have such a wider like range of like who God is and his love and, and what mm. he calls us to do and walking in that. And, you know, we all want these really Christians are so fun. Like we want these really shiny ministries. Mm. Like we just want this, like everybody wants to be us. We want these ministries. We want to be the face, you know, we mm. want to be on Instagram. And, you know, I always joke in our group, I'm like, if you're looking for a spokesmodel, mm with fake eyelashes on Instagram, like you are the wrong lady. Like I'm the one with bags under her eyes mm. because I've been on the ground crying, praying mm. and crying all morning. Mm. And so, you know, there's no, like, I, I, I have really kind of learned to separate kind of like Christianity, like worldly, like what it looks like mm. to what the book of Acts says it looks like. Yeah. And I think with our group, it, you know, it all started with in home groups and it all started with just telling people about Jesus door to door. And I, I think our group is really, we kind of went back to the basics of what mm. that looks like. And I think for me personally, that's what I've learned that mm. like this whole stage performance, Christianity isn't really like what I was looking for in my mm. life. And it wasn't where I was at. And, mm. and I'm just so thankful for my roots that, that I had. And I'm so thankful for, for what the Lord has done in my life and where he's led me. And I'm just thankful for this path that I'm on. Mm. I, if without that phone call, I would not have found the Lord that I know today. Mm. Yeah. Changed my life what I originally thought was mm. for horrible reasons, mm. but it was for the better. It was for God. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Yeah. I remember something you said that actually stuck with me in, you know, when we first spoke a few weeks ago and you was talking about pointing kids to Jesus, not to church. Yes. Like the, the difference yes. between that. And then I, I mean, I thought it was a great point. I was wondering if you'd want to go into that a bit. 
Yes. You know, I love that. Uh, you know, of course, when you're in this position, mm. you're going to always ask yourself, what did I do wrong? Mm. <laughs> Where did I go wrong? And, you know, I don't know if there was, if there's just like one thing I could point to that I wish I would have done different, but I do know one huge thing mm. that would have made a huge difference, I think now. Mm. And I always tell young moms mm. that don't take your kids to church. Don't, don't take them to church, mm. take them to Jesus. And I wish I would have spent more time in um, personal prayer and taking my kids to the Lord and just showing him, showing them like who he is and mm. his goals and letting them see those things in their life. You know, I was very faithful to take them to church mm. and I was very faithful to send them to Christian school. And I was very faithful to um, send them to youth group, mm. but I like I wish I would have taken them to Jesus into that relationship mm. more than introducing them to religion, which failed them. Yeah. So, um, you know, I feel like in our churches, a lot of times too, we, you know, we, we kind of have gotten away from singing old hymns and we sing a lot of praise courses and I love both, mm. but you know, you think back, back in the day, like our old hymns were all about theology, yeah. you know, the verses yeah. and a problem hmm. and then they introduce the solution to the problem mm -hmm. our praise choruses the things we sing now you know we sing about how great god is and he mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. he is so mighty and he mm -hmm. is so great but we don't ever see the struggle and how yeah. he fixed them in the end and i think mm -hmm. that's just kind of a thing in the church as well mm -hmm. that we don't really do a great job of showing our kids that mm -hmm. life is going to have these struggles yeah. And that God is bigger than any of mm. them. And he's, he can work through them with you instead mm. of just walking away and deconstructing your faith because you found something that hurt you, that you didn't like what they said. Yeah. You know, we need to learn how to wrestle through the hard things together. Mm. And I wish I would have done that more with my kids. What other <laughs> lessons do you feel like you've learned through this or are learning you know, maybe? I've, you know, I, I've learned that mm. God had two kids, Adam and Eve, and they both were prodigals from the beginning. So mm. even he kind of didn't get that right at the beginning. I always <laughs> joke, you know, even he struggled with like kids that <laughs> obeyed them. And so, you know, we have to, we really have to get to the point that you, you have to let the shame go mm. and you have to let the what coulda, should have go of what mm. I would have done different. Mm. And I had to get to that point where, you know, I had to come to like three steps. I call it gas, my mm. gas movement. I had to, you know, I had to go, I had to mm. go to the altar and I had to lay it all down yeah. and give it to the Lord and not pick it back up. You know, mm. I had to, the A and gas, I had to ask, I went to my child and I asked for forgiveness and I said, you know, if there was something I didn't teach you about the Lord, or if there was mm. some confusion, mm. or if I did something that led you astray, I'm asking for forgiveness for that. Mm. Because that was never my intention. My intention was for you to fall in love with Jesus. Mm. And so I think we have to be honest with ourselves and just ask if there was mm. something that we did ask for forgiveness. And then the S I go, I, we have to stand. Like mm -hmm. I said before, we, we fight from victory. So, mm -hmm. you know, it says in Galatians that we, uh, or Ephesians, that we need to put on the armor of God. Mm -hmm. And so after you put on all of those things, it says to stand. And then the next word says, and then stand. So once you've done all this and stand, the second stand is where faith comes in. Mm -hmm. So I am going to make sure that I'm doing everything the Lord calls me to do. Mm -hmm. And I've put on my armor and I am prayed up and I am where I'm supposed to be. But then my job is done. My job is to stand and mm. stand in faith and to give it to the Lord and watch him work. Mm. That's, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. That is absolutely true what you're saying. Um, so, Deborah, can you, if you're happy to share, what has your husband's journey been like as a, as a dad and as a husband to yes. you as you're doing Battle Cry Mom? What, what's that look like? Right. You know, it is, it's a whole different journey. Mm -hmm. And we all, one thing I've realized through all of this is we all have a different faith. We all started at a different place mm -hmm. and we all hear from the Lord in our heart language of how mm -hmm. he speaks to us. And I've noticed for, for my husband, but also for other husbands of our battle cry moms, they just have a whole different journey mm -hmm. of, of working through this. And, you know, a lot of times they're very silent on the matter. Um, a lot of times, you know, in, in these situations, particularly that they, they take it upon themselves, the shame and the hurt that they were the head of the family and 
and their mm. kids took a different path and it's all their fault. And it's hard to get out of that. And so I would say his journey um, is, is completely different from mm. mine. And so it's, I think it's probably in some ways harder as being the, the father of the house um, mm. just because of what they take on. And it yeah. definitely is, is hard. It's hard to speak about and it's hard. Again, you see all your friends and they did all these things and their kids are doing all of these mm. things. And, you just thought your family was going to look like this and now it doesn't. And so it's just hard to like work through that and figure out like where I am. Um, you know, I know that we, you know, we probably don't talk about it as much as we should because mm. we kind of talk about it from different angles. But, you know, I think for me, I'm the mom yeah, and I held a child in my arms and said, I will never mm. stop loving you mm. and I will fight for you every day of my life. And I, you know, I, I know that I counted the cost when I started this whole journey of speaking about mm. it and the mm. cost was going to be high. I knew that there would be times that maybe my friends would, would turn their back on me because maybe mm. I took a stance that wasn't theirs. I know the Lord said, people are going to unfriend you and I'm a people pleaser. So that mm. was going to be hard. I knew that was going to be hard, you know, but I knew that there might come a day that even my own kids might say, mom, you need to quit talking about this. Mm. This isn't, I don't like what you're saying, or I don't want you to do, but I always mm. say I have counted the cost and we all have to do that in whatever ministry God puts us in. We count yeah. the cost and the earthly cost might be that I lose relationship with people, mm. but I live in a heavenly world and I am waiting for the next great thing mm. when I get to heaven. Mm. And it is my goal to not have Christmas dinner on this earth. It's my goal to have all of my children around the marriage supper of the lamb mm. table, you know, and, Amen. and it, that is what mm. I am. I'm just keeping eternity in mind. Mm. And I believe my husband is as well. And we might have different journeys to how we get there yeah. with them. Um, mm. But we have eternity in mind. Mm. And I, we have counted the cost that on, on this earth, you know, it doesn't matter what happens because all that matters is that my family and my friends and those I love and every product out there, makes it mm. to heaven. And that's what mm. we're focusing on. We're not going to yeah. get caught up on the, and the differences of what we mm. believe and the differences of how to get there. We're focusing on the end goal to get our yeah. kids to heaven. Yeah. I love what you're saying. Cause, and I love that you are so, um, heavenly minded about it all with your feet very much on the ground, but your mind, um, heavenly minded at the same time. Cause I think that's what we are as believers called to do. Right. And, um, you know, like, as you said, counting the cost, what does that mean for us here? But what does that mean for us in eternity? If you could share one core message with parents that might be going through a similar trial or, um, you know, just other hardships or what, what would, what would that be? You know, I, there's so many Bible stories I, that are my favorite. And mm -hmm. I tend to say that about every one of them, like, this is my favorite, but I really do love the story, um, with uh, King David, when him and his men were out fighting mm. and they came home and they found out that the enemy came in mm. and stole their wives and their children and, mm. and burned their homes down and took their kids away. And there was this moment in David's life in, in that with his men that they just wailed and cried for the loss that they had that was so great. Mm. But there was a moment that they got up and David sought the Lord. It says mm. in his word that he sought the Lord and the Lord, he asked, Lord, what am I going to do? And the Lord said, you're going to pursue him. Yeah. And David and his men made a decision that day that the enemy might have came in mm. to steal your families and your children, mm. but you're going to pursue them and you're going to get them back. And there's not going to be a hair on their head harmed. And I believe that is the message that I would love to share mm. with parents today, that mm. the message of battle cry is no one fights alone. Mm. And so we are in this together and we are going to pursue our children we're going to refuse. I love the story of it, where it talks about Jeremiah, about Rachel weeping for her children and the mm. loss. It was symbolic of the loss when the, when Israelites were going into captivity, it was symbolic when they were passing her tomb, the Rachel weeping for her children, that every dream that she had for this nation was lost mm. in that moment as they were going on. But mm. if you go on to read, you know, after this happened, the Lord said that he was going to bring them back from the land of the enemy. And so mm. Rachel refused to be comforted. And that's my other message is that mm. we pursue our families mm. and we refuse refuse to be comforted. We mm. refuse to listen to the world, say mm. that our kids are like this and it's okay. Mm. We refuse to say that this is, they're all 
can live any lifestyle they want and they're going to be okay. We refuse to believe the lies of the enemy. And so we're going to pursue our families. We're going to refuse and we're going to, nobody fights alone. That is my mm. message is that mm. we are in this together. And if you need a group, if you need um, a support group, please join us in Battle Cry Moms mm. because we are in this together. This mm. message isn't always for the big capital C church because they're all wrapped up in their own little ministries. This message is for any mom that is out there listening that says, yes, this is me. I am alone mm. and I need support. Mm, that's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're right. Like, I think we do look for um, for comfort and, you know, a, a palatable response that we yes. can that we can swallow. And that seems right by society. But actually refusing that comfort. Yes. Is refusing once again, confidence. keeping your faith and your eyes on the Lord. Yes. Mm. So um, looking uh, forward then you I know you said you've got a book coming that you're writing yes. and you're you've got this community that that you've built um what are your hopes for that where is it heading can you share a bit about that yes and so what started with me and a couple of friends in battle cry and like I had said I hoped we would have a hundred people someday mm. <laughs> and I thought that would be amazing yeah. right now as of today we have over 1200 moms mm. from around the world some of them are from other countries and it grows every single day um Fantastic. every single day and it, it's just a word of mouth movement it's just mm. a grassroots movement if you're listening and you don't have a prodigal mm. I bet you know someone that does mm tell them about us and so my hope is that that we grow it to, to as big as it needs to be if that's ten thousand if that's a hundred thousand mm. but my ultimate goal is that i can close this down mm. and we have to we do away with it because all the prodigals are home and we don't need yes. it any longer <laughs> and so that's the ultimate goal mm. is to put mm. ourselves out of a job here but um my book i did i wrote a book about all of this mm -hmm. and and what the, all the wrestlings of the Lord um, it's my story of, of just what he's brought me through and mm -hmm. where he's led me and it is coming out I believe September 1st and so we'll be okay. doing some pre-sales for that this summer and I'm super excited mm -hmm. and scared all at the same time <laughs> to tell the story yeah um, but God is faithful and I know mm -hmm. if it helps one mom then it's worth it all mm -hmm. No, that's great. That's really great. We'll we'll add all that information to um, our show notes. Deborah, as we, um, I'm conscious of time, so as we wrap up, could you tell our listeners that if how they can connect with you? So if they're interested in being part of Battle Cry Mom or checking it out or accessing any other resources that you could recommend, um, or just to you know maybe get in touch with you directly and just have a have a chat, what would be a good way to do that? Yeah, so I would love to, if you have any questions, you, I would love for you to contact me. You can email me at battlecrymoms at yahoo.com. Um, uh, you could get on my website, which is www.debbymcninch.com, and you can get all kinds of information on there. We put printables on there. We put the battle plan on there, how to pray for your children. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're a mom or a dad and you want this community, you can join us at battlecrymoms.com or battlecrydads.com. And so um, we would love for you. You would be welcomed in um, and you would think you've known these women for your whole life. It's a very welcoming group. Um, and we, we would just love anybody that needs support. And I would love to come out if you have a church or an organization or just want to get mm. coffee. I would tell our story and talk to anybody that wants to hear it. Mm. Thanks for that, Deborah. I'll, I'll add all that to our show notes. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience that we haven't covered today? Um, I just want to say again that it's all glory to God. Mm. He is He is our Savior. He is our King. Mm. And, you know, He is coming soon. And so we have work to do mm. and we need to get busy. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Deborah, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. I really have appreciated you being so candid yeah. with us today. And um, I love I love listening to your heart, the, the hope you. that you hold for yes. um, what's coming in a very yes. near future, hopefully. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And, you know, the, the faith that you have and um, the community that you're building and pointing all of all those moms and dads towards Jesus as well. It's, it's really quite incredible. So thank, thank you so you. much for sharing with us. It's it's been really great to have you on. 
Thank you so much. Bye for now. And just like that, we have reached the end of another fascinating conversation. Now remember to check out Crowd Church at www.crowd.church, even if you might not see the point of church. You see, we are a digital church on a quest to discover how Jesus can help us live a more meaningful life. We are a community, a space to explore the Christian faith and a place where you can contribute and grow. And you are welcome at Crowd Church. Don't forget to subscribe to the What's the Story podcast on your favorite podcast app because we've got a treasure trove of inspiring stories coming your way and we will basically hate for you to miss any of them. And just in case no one has told you yet today, remember, you are awesome. Yes, you are. Created awesome. It's just a burden you have to bear. What's the Story is a production of Crowd Church our fantastic team, including Anna Kettle, Sadaf Bainon, and me, Matt Edinson, uh, and Tanya Hutzelak, work behind the scenes tirelessly to bring you all these fabulous stories. Our theme song is a creative work of Josh Edmondson. And if you're interested in the transcript or show notes, head over to our website, whatsthestorypodcast.com. And whilst you're there, sign up for our free weekly newsletter to get all of this goodness delivered straight to your inbox. So that's it from all of us this week here at What's The Story. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic week wherever you are in the world. We'll catch you next time. Bye for now.